Um, thanks very much for coming along. Uh, my name is Declan Walsh. I'm a journalist with the New York Times newspaper based in Cairo in Egypt. I'm the bureau chief over there. Um, I'm here with Raisha Khalid Diab and uh, Hopefully, you're, if you're at the right seminar, you know you're at uh, Addressing um, Islam for the Politically Incorrect. Addressing the myths and preconceptions surrounding Islam. Um, very briefly, it just seems to me that it's never been a more important time to have this kind of conversation. Uh, certainly in the Western world, but I think also in the Islamic world. Um, when we look at the rise of populists, nationalism in Europe and in the United States, uh, when we look at sort of violent attacks and the reactions that they have engendered um, across this continent and others, um, but also I think inside the debate that's taking place in different forms inside the Muslim world about what it means to be Muslim and about how that re relationship with the outside world plays out. Um, we're going to talk about uh, women, we're going to talk about the notion of jihad, we are going to talk about, what else do you want to talk about? Uh, whatever comes up. Whatever clash comes of, up. Clash of civilizations. Clash of civilizations. Uh, terrorism, everything. <laughs> we'll, we'll be guided by uh, a book that Khaled is in the process of writing. He's going to read first uh, from part, an excerpt from a chapter in that book about women in Islam. Um, we're going to talk briefly, and then we're going to throw it open to you. Um, I'm hoping this, this will be a session that will be very much driven by questions from the audience, uh, queries that you might, might have, or observations you'd like to make, um, and we'll take the conversation from there. So, Khaled. Uh, thanks, Declan. Thank you for the introduction. And you made uh, a lot of valid points, which uh, we'll address during uh, the discussion. So yes, the book I'm working on is called Islam for the Politically Incorrect. Um, and um, the reason uh, I decided to write it is because for years now, as a journalist and as a human being, I've noticed an increasingly polarized and alarmingly uh, dangerous debate, uh, often uninformed, often supported by half-truths and myths. Um, and, um, and this debate uh, is spinning out of control, whether it's between Muslim societies and Western societies, whether it's within each, you know, there's a lot of uh, misconception and um, misunderstanding. So I'm going to start off by reading, uh, as Declan said, as, um, an excerpt from the chapter on women. The reason I've chosen to, to read from this chapter is because women, whether they want it or not, have become a, a battle, an ideological battlefield, a battleground, uh, uh, both between the two sides and within each camp, and, uh, it's, um, and also between the patriarchy and you know, the anti-patriarchy, if you like. So... Um, and, I, and I'm going to look at one area which is symbolically uh, related to this debate. I'm going to start by reading the introduction to the section on, on the hijab. So just bear with me as I pull it up. Okay, so the section is entitled The Fabric of Piety. Rarely, if ever, has a piece of cloth created such controversy. For European and American conservatives, the hijab threatens to shed the fabric of society. For conservatives in Muslim countries, the Islamic headscarf stitches society together, and like the hymen, the honor of the family and the community hangs by the flimsy threads of the hijab. In Europe, the hijab is widely regarded as a symbol of oppression and barbarity, and the woman who wears one is often considered to be a downtrodden victim. Afrah Nasser, who normally leaves her curly hair exposed, decided as a social experiment to put on a headscarf in Sweden, where she lives, 
and gauge the reactions she received. I quote here, I wore a scarf in Ethiopian style worn by my grandmother. I looked like I was wearing a hijab. The Ethiopian Yemeni writer and feminist explained, my experience was so different to going out with my curly hair. Just going to, buy, uh, uh, to the shop to buy something was horrible. They made me feel like an idiot. With the degree to which hijab and Muslim, the hijab and Muslim women have become interlinked in the Western imagination, some cannot get their heads around liberal Muslim women who dress differently. For example, Rola Jibril, the Palestinian-Italian journalist, remembers an incident when she first started working on Italian television and turned up in a figure-hugging white dress. I quote her here, the producer asked me if I was a Muslim because of the way I dressed. He couldn't understand that this was the way I had always dressed. He thought it was the influence of Italy on me. Nevertheless, being a secular liberal Arab woman has not shielded Jibril from the rising tide of Islamophobia, with the hijab just a noose with which the far right wants to figuratively hang Muslims. This was on naked display when peroxide blonde Geert Wilders with the eccentric hair, the Dutch precursor of Donald Trump, bizarrely proposed what he called a head rag tax. What, you may wonder, was the leader of the Party for Freedom, the PVV, thinking or even smoking? As a way to discourage the wearing of the hijab and because the headscarf polluted public space, making the polluter pay for the symbol of oppression made sense, he claimed. We will finally get some money back out of what has cost us so much, Wilders, who prefers a full ban on hijab, insisted. What Wilders believes he is legally unable to do in the Netherlands, his French counterpart is openly proposing in her own country. In October 2016, Marine Le Pen, the head of the far-right Front National, pledged that if elected, she would ban the hijab and other symbols of the Islamic faith from all public spaces, not just from public schools where it has been prohibited for some years. But in order to translate this blatantly discriminatory policy into law, Le Pen felt compelled to fit her proposal into France's long secular tradition of laicite and dress it up as a ban on all religious symbols, symbols in public. A necessary sacrifice, she insisted, in her battle against Islam. Oops, against Islamic extremism. I quote her here, I know that every French person, including Jews, can understand that if we ask for the sacrifice from them in the framework of the battle against the advance of Islamic extremism, they will make this effort and understand it. This has caused concern and outrage in some Christian circles. And I quote here, please pray for France and its future. No Christian should be forced to hide their faith, a writer with Catholic Online beseeched apparently untroubled about Muslims and Jews having to hide their faith. While demanding sacrifices from Muslims and Jews, Le Pen offered fellow Catholics a special pass to a secret trap door in her plan. She explained that her proposal was to ban conspicuous symbols and open, uh, opened that the Catholic religion doesn't have conspicuous symbols. It seems that Le Pen has never met a monk, a nun, a priest, or has never seen Christians wearing crosses so big they make them walk with a slight stoop. And she definitely hasn't watched Sister Act. Or perhaps conspicuous for Le Pen uh, is a synonym for non-Christian. Of course, not everyone is as hypocritical and racist or Islamophobic. Secular intellectuals in France have long been anti-clerical and suspicious of religion. After all, the French Revolution was a backlash against the two ruling estates, the clergy and the nobility, and against how the church legitimized the rampant inequalities and injustices during the Ancien Regime. The Lassité versus Sisterhood dilemma represents a challenge for French feminists. It leaves some feminists in a bind between the values they believe in and the manipulation of those values by the envoys of hate. I quote here, on the one hand, I support the intransigent application of secularism, wrote feminist and academic Browning Winter. On the other hand, I distrust a hypocritical and racist state. Despite the presence of well-meaning feminists in France, mainstream French feminists' rejection of the headscarf, which was reportedly banned from their meetings before it was banished from schools, 
and their aloof attitudes towards Muslim women, which has helped legitimize identity politics and a clash of civilizations narrative, has drawn criticism from fellow feminists. I quote here, if French feminists saw scarf wearing Muslims as oppressed women, contends Christine Delphi, uh, the author of Separate and Dom Separate and Dominate, Feminism and Racism After the War on Terror, it should be a reason not to expel them from school or to curtail their movements, but to embrace them. Okay, uh, or right, I just read this one last paragraph, so we don't overrun. Many however, many intellectuals and even feminists in the Arab and Muslim world regard the expressed Western intent to free Muslim, uh, Muslim women from the chains of the hijab, niqab, and other Islamic garb as simply an excuse for neo-colonial meddling. This was nowhere more apparent than in the United States' catastrophic invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. The advance of freedom in the greater Middle East has given new rights and new hopes to women there, then President George W. Bush said in another example of his misplaced triumphalism. And then I go on to show how the status of women in Iraq has got actually a lot worse since uh, the 2003 invasion. But, um, and I go on to explore many other aspects, cultural, social, and political, related to the hijab, but I think that's a good point to stop where we, and we can pick up the discussion. Uh, thanks very much, Khaled. Can you just uh, uh, tell us briefly, sorry I didn't mention, what's the title of your book and what made you uh, decide to write it? Uh, it, it? The title is Islam for the Politically Incorrect. Uh, I've toyed with, with a number of titles. My original intention was to call it Islam for Bigots, to be very direct about it. Um, and um, but then, like, after discussions with the publisher and some reflection, we decided that was a bit too in your face. And a lot of people may not feel comfortable holding a book that says bigot on it. Mm. So we went for more, the, more ambiguous Islam for the politically incorrect, because it's a challenge to people who regard themselves as politically incorrect but hold uh, uh, views that are contradictory. Huh? to read this and perhaps even change their mind, although some people, their ideas are so fixed that it's hard to challenge them. Um, but it, it, it's also trying to claim back the word politically incorrect. To my mind, politically incorrect isn't, doesn't mean uh, uh, you know, being right-wing. It doesn't mean uh, you know, um, uh, politically incorrect to me doesn't mean being bigoted or right-wing. To me, it means not uh, 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 holding all sides to the same standards. standards. Mm. That you don't take political considerations into account when you apply your standards, when you apply your criteria. That there's not one measuring rule for one side and another measuring rule for another side. That, to me, is political and when, and when it comes to discussion about Islam, what do you see as the principle? I mean, we, we, you, you've read very nicely from your passage there about the hijab and women and the loaded symbolism that's taken, that it has taken on, particularly in the West in recent years. What are the other areas that you're looking at? Uh, well, uh, the chapters I've written so far are about... Um, Muslim women, also on the gender issue, I've got a separate chapter which is rarer uh, because it's an issue that's under, under addressed on Muslim men, actually. Uh, like, it, like there's a, a, a real polarization in the a, in a, in a portrayal of Muslim men in the West, like the Hollywood Arab, for example, you know, the real bad Arab, you know, you know is vicious, violent, uh, um, is uh, like uh, fanatical, uh, is a misogynist, a hater of women, um, um, is irrational, and uh, you know, and when he's not all those things, he's some sort of like slimy uh, seductor. You but know? Is, isn't that racism as much as something to do with Islam? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's, it, it's an overlapping of different types of prejudice and discrimination. And look, every society has prejudice and discrimination. I mean, I mean uh, in, the, in the Arab world, we have a lot of prejudice against, say, uh, uh, you know, Europeans, for example. You know, you know, there's this idea that European men aren't real men or, you know, or, uh, you know, or that only, only Europeans are racists. We're not, even though, like, in Egypt, there's a serious uh, attitude problem towards black Africans, you know. 
um, uh, uh, things like that. But so between this one side and on the conservative Islamic side, you've got you know the depiction of the what what is seen as you know the 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 the, 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 the right kind of Arab man, the pious sort of. Uh, um, Member of the patriarchy, the alpha male, the, the the you know the man who knows how to put a woman in her place and stuff like that. Between those two extremes, the large number of men who 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 uh, you know believe say in gender equality, who are modern, who are open-minded, uh, who may or may not practice their faith. A lot of them do practice their faith, but they don't believe their faith excludes them treating women as equals. Huh? Those are lost. You know, they're, they're either airbrushed out of the picture or they're derided in the West as not actually existing. There's no such thing as a modern Arab man. There's no such thing as a moderate Muslim. Mm. Or, you know, in the other side, they're not real, you know, in the uh, Muslim world, among conservatives, they're not real men. They're not, you know, uh, um, they're not real Muslims, that kind of thing. Um, have, you, have you seen much of this play out in your own life? You're, you're born in Egypt. Uh, you live in Belgium at the moment. Um, are, are there members of your own family or people in your own community that you know for you exemplify some of these stereotypes or the majority in the middle that you're talking about? Well, I mean, my f my f my own family is uh, is open-minded. They're, they're religious. I mean, um, but they accept the fact that I'm I'm different. Um, um, and we have like the whole spectrum of attitudes and views in my family, but we also have uh, a toleration for difference. So no, one, no one's too judgmental about uh, uh, other people. Um, but I find in, uh, in I don't actually uh, uh, my base is Belgium, but I'm actually living in Tunisia at the moment. Um, so in Europe, I, I, it's galling sometimes and frustrating. You know that I'm. I have more progressive attitudes uh, towards gender and towards a lot of issues than many many European men I encounter, and yet people sometimes look at me with suspicion. You know, when I'm my wife is Belgian. You know, so when we're out together, sometimes you know, some people give her a look of pity or, or concern or something like that, and she finds that you know infuriating. You know, she. Um, she, like on TV sometimes, like there was a documentary a, few, a couple of years ago about uh, Belgian women who married Muslim men. And without exception, they all married conservative men. Huh? Some of them had a hell, uh, some of them didn't, huh? but they were exclusively conservative men, you know. So, so like, you know, my wife's con like comment was, why couldn't they come and talk to people like you and me or like, you know, our, all the, our friends who who have similar attitudes and lifestyles, you know. Um, but that said, I mean, we also have a bit of role reversal at home at the moment, you know, um, because of my, the freelance nature of my work, you know. I've become the primary carer for our son, and my wife, you know, up until a month and a half ago, she was actually spent the week in Gaza and the weekends with us, so I took care of my son. And actually, like surprisingly, few people in the, in the Arab society we were living in, you know, found that r peculiar. And I actually knew a couple of other Arab men in, a, in the same situation. So you know, people do accept a lot of people. You know, uh, you know, the, the, the silent majority, as you call you would call it, do accept diversity. Uh, also, the you know the Arab revolutions, even though they've had a lot of violent consequences, one consequence has been that people have opened their eyes up to the fact that there are so many alternatives in life and they tolerate them. Um, and a lot of people are more, more and more willing to experiment with alternative lifestyles. Like I had an Egyptian friend in uh, Tunisia who defied his family's expectations, not in Tunisia, sorry, in Geneva, when we were living in Geneva. And he gave up his job in Cairo because there was an, a, a, a forced separation with his wife because she was working in Geneva, he was working in Cairo. So in the end he decided her job was, had more promise than his, so he gave up his job in Cairo and went and joined her in Geneva the, uh, against the protests of his family. Uh, I didn't have protests from my family because my, my mom, before she died, she's very cool. She's, she was always uh, had feminist inclinations, even though she's a devout Muslim. And uh, you know, she believes everyone should choose their own path in life. 
So, but uh, anyway, he, he, he resisted all the pressure from his family and went ahead anyway. And, um, and a lot of his friends looked at him differently and so on, but he still stuck to his guns. Um, I'm going to throw it open to questions in a moment. I just want to turn to one quick thing just from the passage that you read before mm -hmm. we get to that. Um, I mean, you, you spoke about uh, the politicization of the veil in European politics and so on. Um, is, is, is there an onus, do you think, among Muslims themselves to better explain what the role of the veil is? Or do you think this is all just about the uh, misconceptions or the instrumentalization of the veil by politicians who, in, in the West or in Europe who see it as, you know, for them it's become this symbol of uh, the intolerance and the misogyny of, of Islam? Absolutely. I mean, uh, Muslims have a, a bit of a role to play, uh, but that role that role can sometimes be lost in a cacophony. Like it's, you know, you know one like far-right politician or one radical Islamic preacher can wipe out and drown out you know, hundreds of people like me. You know? You know, I don't capture front-page news by talking about the sort of like mundanity of daily life you know, uh, uh, and how Muslims are just humans like everyone else. But uh, so there's that, and there's the other issue that Muslims sometimes, uh, some Muslims, I shouldn't generalize, uh, sometimes go to the other extreme of trying to present their religion and culture uh, 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 as being, you know, um, whereas you know the far right present it as being evil, they present it as being like benign, completely benign. Huh? you know, sort of glossing over the, all the abuses against women in many Muslim societies. You know, like a lot of people will protest, a lot of Muslims I know, conservative Muslims, will protest against, you know, any infringements on a Muslim's right to, to express their religion in Europe, mm. but then they won't defend a woman's right in Saudi Arabia to walk around with her hair bare, you know? Right. Or, or they'll be silent about it. Mm. You know, they either won't defend it or they'll be silent about it, or they'll, they'll actually, ironically, use the same argument that the far right uses in Europe. You have to adapt to the local culture, mm. you know? Mm. So th there's an issue of double standards uh, uh, on both sides, but when one side is a weaker side, you know, uh, um, their double standards aren't as dangerous as when it's the stronger side. Okay, great, yeah. okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna throw this open. Um, is there anyone here who'd like, please? Do we have a microphone? Uh, sorry. Uh, while the microphone's coming. Yeah, I mean, it's often struck me as well that um, I remember I was in the United States during the election recently, uh, helping out with our coverage, and um, obviously um, Muslims, or Muslim, the role of Muslims in American society came up at a couple of points, particularly when Khizr Khan, a, a Pakistani origin man, gave a speech against Donald Trump at the Democratic Convention that really set the convention on fire and dictated the political, dictated the, uh, the course of the, of the campaign for several days. Um, and of course, Donald Trump pushed back and tried to, uh, you know, have a go at his wife by saying that she was wearing a headscarf because she was under, effectively under the foot of her husband, which of course just wasn't true. Um, and, you know, a lot of American Muslims very rightly, um, you know, almost militantly wear the hijab or wear a, wear a headscarf because they, they feel they want to point it out. And at the same time, I've, before I was based in Cairo, I lived in Pakistan for um, quite some years. And uh, it also struck me that at the same time, there's a lot of women in Pakistan who do not have a choice about whether they want to wear that headscarf. And it all seems to be incredibly contextual about whether, you know, whether, well, whether you can or not. Exactly. That's the important thing. Regardless of the human society involved, you know, individual citizens are not part, they, they can't be forced to be part of a collective. That's my, my fundamental view. Mm. You cannot force someone to adopt an identity that they don't want to adopt. Mm? So that means you can't force a Muslim woman to take off her headscarf or a Muslim man to shave his beard or whatever in, in Europe. You can't force a woman to wear a headscarf in a Muslim country or restrict her movement or not allow her to travel without, you know, permi the permission of, uh, you know, a guardian, or, or, or not to drive, like in Saudi Arabia. Mm. So, you know, you know, uh, 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 people, as long as they're not doing any actual harm to others, they should have the freedom to choose who they want to be. 
Okay, let's turn to, uh, yeah. please. Thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering, what would you like to see from journalists in Europe? Um, what could they do to represent Muslims in a more, like, in a better way, basically? Uh, that's a very good and very difficult question. Um, I think uh, there, there, are, there are a number of areas. I mean, I can't talk about journalists as a whole. I mean, there are some brilliant journalists who do amazing work on, on, on this topic. Um, but I think one area is, um, is depth of knowledge. Like a lot of journalists, myself included at one time, I mean, my knowledge deepens all the time as I, you know, research, you know, about different stereotypes and misconceptions and ideas people have, and you discover that certain things that people think are set in stone are actually not. Uh, and, but I think an important thing to, to, to point out in order to challenge the polarization that's occurring is that the, the diversity, you know, there's, there's diversity within mainstream European society, there's diversity within mainstream Muslim society, there's diversity among the Muslim minority. I mean, for example, the idea of calling, it, calling them Muslims wherever they are, that's something new. You know, you know it gives a, a sort of monolithic idea. You know, but what is called a European Muslim, actually they have very little in common. You know, like, uh, you know, like uh, Pakistani and Bangladeshi and Bengali and whatever Muslims in Britain have very little in common to Algerian Muslims in France. Uh, also, say Algerian Muslims in France or Muslims as they define in France, according to, to, to research, at least a quarter to 30% of them are atheists. You know, or don't believe in religion. You know, they may not be atheists, but they don't believe in religion. Uh, you know. So calling them a Muslim, it's a cultural catch-all, you know. Uh, but what, what would you propose as an alternative then? I mean, you know, if you're writing a story and uh, let's say, to pick, you know, a topical example, there's been a, a terrorist attack and the person who's identified as the perpetrator identifies as a, as a Muslim. Is, you know, we, yeah, may, we may not know what the motivations of the person are, we may not know, but we know that this person's religion is there. And maybe to go to your question, a journalist might wonder, you know, how are we supposed to reference this? Is this Absolutely. And no, I'm not saying we shouldn't use the word Muslim. Mm. If a person self-identifies as a Muslim and puts their Muslim identity above all else, mm. then of course you have to call them a Muslim. Mm. You know, it would be dishonest not to. But if I'm, my, my primary identities are not religion. You know, I'm, I'm an atheist. I'm secular. You know, I'm culturally partly Muslim, mm. uh, uh, culturally partly Western or European. Uh, uh, you know, you know I, other labels fit me much more, like an Egyptian or, or a Belgian or an Anglophile or someone who grew up in Britain. Or, you know, there's lots of other labels, sure. you know. So, you know, uh, when it's not directly relevant, then you... You, you need to also use other labels like, you know, an Algerian Frenchman or a, sure. or a Moroccan Belgian or, th uh, you know, stuff like that to show that, you know, like Moroccans and Algerians hate each other generally, <laughs> you know? You know, uh, Pakistanis and Indians hate each other. Even Pakistani and Indi Pakistanis and Indian Muslims often have rivalry, not just Indian Hindus, Indian Muslims. You know, because a lot of Indian Muslims didn't want partition, for example. Uh, uh, you know, so, so to try and lump them all together under one umbrella, it, it's, it, it's veiling a lot of uh, complexity. Mm. Mm. Great. Anybody else? Sir. Buonasera. Avrei una domanda riguardo la... I must speak in English. Yes, if you don't mind. Uh, I mean, if you don't mind, uh, uh, honestly, bit, unless someone, if, if you wish to speak in Italian difficult. and someone can translate um, this, that would be great. Um, I want to ask you a, a question um, um, uh, la, to a um, like person, to an atheist person. In, uh, in uh, Egypt, in 2012, there was, uh, it was approved a constitution that was quite right-wing. I have read the articles that you wrote that, you wrote that were uh, quite hard against that. Uh, an attempt 
to um, sup oppress the rights of Copts, of, uh, of Christian, Egypt, Egyptian. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, I, in fact, the uh, Egyptian constitution of 2012 was abolished by a coup, by, uh, by, the, mil by the army, by the Egyptian army. In fact, uh, in, and so I, um, I want to ask you a question. When, uh, like, um, when the, the religious right is, is winning, in fact, was winning in Egypt, what, what could a, a like person, a person who doesn't want that the right wing, the, 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 the religious right wing um, has, uh, take the control of the country, what can uh, the person do? Ooh. Thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, that, that definitely, you yeah. know, I think the speaker's question goes to uh, an important issue about Muslim, a lot of Muslim countries themselves. They will, you look at Egypt or many others, um, Islam is hardwired into the constitution. You know, the, 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 the constitution in many countries will say that all laws must be subservient ultimately to Sharia law, even if in practice it might be different. And even, in many of those countries, I think you probably find the majority of people want to keep it that way. I can't speak about all Muslim countries from my own experience because my knowledge is not that mm. encyclopedic. But I can speak about the Egyptian context that you're talking about. Uh, yes, Egypt has had a... Constitutionally, has had something of a regression. Like, the, its original constitution in 1923 didn't mention religion. And it described Egypt as, uh, you know, a, 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 an Arab state. It didn't mention religion or Islam. In its 1956 constitu constitution, after the Free Officers Revolution, also didn't mention uh, uh, religion, and actually guaranteed full freedom of uh, um, uh, full freedom of belief. Uh, whether that was actually applied in practice or not, that's a different matter. Because, for example, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood, but it was more political back then, not religious. You know, because the Muslim Brotherhood wanted to bring down a regime, they were all thrown in gulags or, or in prison camps or uh, and also communists, even though Nasser is seen as a, as a, uh, in the West as an ally of the Soviet Union, uh, he, he, his prisons were full of communists, so that kind of undermines the idea of freedom of belief, but it was constitutionally guaranteed at least, as much as an Egyptian constitution is worth. Um, the first person to introduce the word Islam into uh, the Egyptian constitution was Sadat, because he wanted to appease the Islamists and win them on side to neutralize the secularists who didn't like him. Um, and then it was kind of devolved from there. But uh, during a constitutional like uh, assembly that, uh, that turned out to be Islamist document, there was a lot of protest against attempts to bring Islam into it. The current constitution, when it comes to it's a very, you know, faulty document. But when it comes to worship and, and, and freedom of belief, it's contradictory. You know, it, it, it talks about, you know, uh, every citizen has a right to believe what they want, but then at the same time, it says you can't insult Islam, a, a religion. Mm. You can't insult any of the uh, adiensa mawaya, so the, the, the heavenly religions, which is a shorthand in Egypt for Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Uh, so then, like, what, what, what constitutes an insult to religion? That's a very slippery slope um, and can be abused enormously. Um, there was also a, bit, a movement in Egypt among atheists who, who, who came out from the underground and demanded that their rights be recognized in the Constitution. In the end, they weren't recognized outright, but there is a clause that claims to give people full freedom of uh, belief. I hope that helped answer your question. Thank you. <coughs> Please. Hi. Um, I wanted to point out something. So usual, uh, usually the general Muslim narrative, let's put it that way, in Western media is quite negative in the sense that it's very hard to find positive stories about Muslims. Um, in part, I think that's because the religion itself is very politically abused. So I was wondering, in your opinions, um, to what extent does secularization come in there, in the sense that um, in, in Europe and the Western world, Christianity and politics have been quite divided. 
in most Muslim countries that's not the case. So to what extent does that sort of help this political abuse of the Islamic faith, which I think is actually the cause of a lot of misinterpretation? Well, first of all, a nuance. Much as the West likes to believe it's secularized, it's not that secularized. You know, there is no real absolute separation. There's a separation between church and state in most countries, but it's not a separation between religion and politics. Uh, there's a big difference between the two. Uh, in Italy, for example, the Catholic uh, lobby has a huge influence on politics. Uh, same in Belgium until recently, you know, until, uh, you know, a f v like when my father-in-law was young, the Catholic church had huge political influence. You know, the king abdicated in Belgium when Belgium passed an abortion law, he abdicated for one day, he found a loophole because he objected. In America, you've got a White House populated you know, by Christian fanatics who want to turn America into a Christian nation. You know? uh, so, so you know, uh, it's not entirely secular in, 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 in the West. Um, on the other hand, except for some exceptions, there are some very secular societies like in Northern Europe, uh, a lot of Western Europe, you know, but if you go to Eastern Europe, you know, uh, uh, especially after the collapse of communism, the churches there play, uh, and religious figures play an enormous role in politics. Uh, and that's the thing, I mean, in, in a Muslim world, there, uh, you know, in a lot of countries, there is no, no real clergy with political sway. They're under the thumb of secular leaders, you know. Uh, so uh, that, that's one thing. Also, a lot you can't generalize about Muslim societies. There are some Muslim societies that are quite secular, some that are very secular, you know. But even in secular societies, religion plays a role. Like Turkey, Turkey is still a secular state, but because it's governed by an Islamist party, hmm, uh, they're trying to roll this back. But the same is happening in America, you know, as in Turkey. The difference is propor proportion uh, or, 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 or magnitude. There are more Muslim countries where religion is politicized and religion is in the public sphere because it's not just about politics, it's also about the social exploitation of religion, uh, political and social. So, so yeah, in Muslim societies generally, uh, uh, religion is in the public domain more than it is in the West. But even in secular, uh, very secular Western societies, there is still a lot of leftovers. For example, I don't know, um, the fact that divorce takes so long in many uh, uh, Western countries. In Ireland, it's still very... It's slow, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Uh, and I think... Um, in Northern Ireland, you still can't get an abortion or something, you know. Uh, but isn't there a difference between the, you know, religious values of any particular society or of a large group in that society informing the laws and the constitution of that country? Absolutely. And, and, and yes. yeah. it seems that many, um, a, a good number of uh, Muslim-majority countries, not all, as you say, but a good number, um, you know, are still politically at least wrestling with this idea of how to accommodate religion and the modern nation state. Absolutely. And, and uh, the confusion over that debate often seems to create a space in which extremists move and propose radical solutions going back to caliphates, to uh, use the most current yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But what I'm, saying, I'm trying to say is uh, 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 this is a, a general human uh, uh, phenomena in the 21st century, mm. the revival of religion mm. for the late 20th, the early 21st century for a huge number of reasons, uh, but one of its most extreme manifestations at the moment is in the Muslim world. But it, Syria and Iraq with Islamic but in a lot of the But it's a developing world issue as well. Mm. Because in the developed world, this trend has been uh, uh, blocked a bit by strong institutions. You know, uh, a, a lot of Muslim countries have very weak nations. Uh, right, they're dominated by the military. Yeah. or the, was And, a, and the, the role of the state is to protect the elite. It's not, mm. you know, so, uh, um, so it's much easier to, to, to batter that down than it would be, say, for Donald Trump and his entourage to, to, to cause a Christian revolution in, in, in America. Mm. You know, uh, in Pakistan, it was with, uh, you know, with the swipe of a general's pen that Sharia law was implemented in a secular state because the army had that kind of power, mm. you know. Um, but that said, uh, political Islam uh, emerged for, for, for a number of reasons, 
But the illusions it sold are, are being discredited and dismantled one by one, and more and more people are falling out of love with political Islam, and that's why it's got so violent. The reason political Islam is so violent today is partly because of the vacuum created by state collapse and, and, and failing states and uh, military interventions, foreign military interventions, but it's also partly because fewer people are listening to them. They thought once they brought the message, you know, the divine message to people, people would just embrace it. When people of their own free will and volition said, no, we don't want this, then they got violent, you know? Mm. Uh, question. Sir. Hello. Um, because the is Islamic culture is, is so difficult to understand, um, would it be uh, better or smart or, uh, if um, the, the, those countries are like um, re re reported by a local um, from, from a Western that the Western organization hires a local journalist to to to, to be the correspondent? Would would that, would would that be a better Solution. If, if if Western newspapers had yeah. had had correspondents in Muslim countries who were who were local, yes, because it, because it's so complex to understand as a foreigner. Well, I mean, I can answer part of that. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> clearly, I'm uh, not the answer to your question. Um, but uh, the, you know, at the newspaper I work at, the New York Times, we do have a number of people who uh, report from us, from West Muslim countries, who are uh, either reporters or indeed the correspondent. I mean, our Afghanistan correspondent is um, a brilliant guy called Majib Mashal, who, who's born in Afghanistan and, and all of that. Having said that, you know, um, the, 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 our role partly as foreign correspondents is to explain those countries um, to, to our readership. Now, our readership is a, is a sort of changing thing at the moment. Before it was very tightly defined. Uh, the New York Times was writing principally for Americans and a smaller number of international people and now we have readership that's much more global and includes the countries that we live in. So it has become a lot more complex. But you know we are trying to explain for an outside readership um, uh, and you know what, what can we bring to that? You can bring to it your own knowledge and experience um, but you're, you're probably right if you are a Muslim I think or if you come from that culture you're definitely uh, from the get-go, a lot better equipped to deal with some of these complexities. Do you have any thought on that? Yeah, I think personally, it's more about the quality of the individual than their background. Mm. Um, if somebody is willing to do the home, their homework, the legwork, and to take a step back and look at things from multiple perspectives, then they have my respect, regardless of where they're from. Uh, also, you know, there's. Uh, in generally speaking, there are advantages to having an insider tell a story and advantages to having an outsider tell a story. You're right. The insider may feel passionately about it one way or another. You know, you can't be... It's more difficult to be impartial about your own family, about your own society, about your own friends, you know. So an outsider can often bring a perspective that an insider may not have. Also, an outsider can bring a comparative perspective, like Declan and I, when we were talking yesterday, he could compare Pakistan with Egypt because he's worked in both, you know. Uh, also, I think, like, you know, for me as a journalist, you know, uh, I reserve the right to be able to comment on, you know, European politics, on Western politics, on uh, whatever. Um, uh, so, I can't deny that right. The difference, or the thing is, it's, a, it's more a question of attitude, you know. You know, in the media, where in media, Western media, where it's all sort of middle-aged white men, for example, you know, telling us what we need to think. What are the great cliches of reporting on Muslim countries by foreign correspondents, people like me? Uh, the the great cliches. Uh, <laughs> um, well, like, uh, so, what one, one great cliche is the idea, traditionally, I mean, one, one, uh, but a lot of Western journalists have challenged and questioned that, but one great traditional cliche is that tribalism is something that happens over there and it doesn't happen here. You know, that sectarianism is something that happens over there, but it doesn't happen here. That society is somehow unchanging, has an essence over there, 
But here it Do you think we have changes. a specific vocabulary that we reserve for the outside world or for the Muslim world that we don't apply to our own societies? A sort of you know, use of words like sectarianism. We love to talk about in Iraq, it's riven by sectarian tensions. Maybe there's similar sectarian tensions here, we just call it something else. I mean, it also goes to this perennial debate about, you know, what, who do you call a terrorist? Yep. Um, a lot of people, a lot of my friends certainly get very exercised when some white person in America goes on a rampage um, and is defined as a white nationalist or, uh, or a, a criminally gun. insane person or whatever. And of course, um, you only have to look at the coverage of the person who carried out the attack in London recently, who was immediately branded as a terrorist. So it does seem that there is a problem of vocabulary between our worlds. Absolutely. But the thing is, the, one, the thing I've learned with time, I used, like, you know, growing up with post-colonial ideas and stuff like that, and, you know, coming from a leftist Arab family, you know, I sort of had the impression that this was something that the West did, you know. But actually, you know, all human society has these prejudiced... Blind spots. Blind right. spots and stuff like that, like, uh, like you know... Um, uh, like when a, a, you know, a, a Western uh, country commits an atrocity in the, in the Middle East, you know, a certain brand of, say, Arab nationalist will condemn it in very blunt terms. But when an Arab regime commits a similar atrocity, right. you know, it's not so... Well, you look at Syria, right? Or even like even ingrained uh, vocabulary, like, you know, European imperialism is seen as uh, conquest and occupation. Uh, the original Arab conquests of what became the Arab and Muslim world uh, uh, were, are called in Arabic futuhayat, which means opening up. So it's kind of like the word liberation, you know? So when is it all right to call something liberation and when is it right, to, when should we call it occupation, you know? Uh, so. So it's a human uh, tendency to have bias, but some biases are more dangerous than others, depending on you know the firepower of the person, who, uh, you know, holding those biases. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No. Um, what are the other? I mean, in your when you were living in Belgium, what were the sort of misconceptions you met about Islam among people you were meeting in your daily life? Um, I think uh, uh, the major misconception is, uh, you know, is, is about uh, the idea that Islam is a monolith. Mm. You know, it's, uh, it's like, you know, um, there's one Islam. One version of Islam, yes, yeah. Uh, whereas there's like many Islams through uh, uh, geography, and, uh, and, t and time, you know. You know, the Islam of today is unlike the Islam of the Middle Ages, uh, or, or even Islam of 50 years ago. Um, the Islam of Egypt is unlike the Islam of Lebanon, it's unlike the Islam of Tunisia or Pakistan or Saudi Arabia, you know. But a lot of people are beginning, uh, uh, since 9-11 actually, I uh, ironically, or, or interestingly, even though bigotry has risen, so has um, awareness and empathy. Like, because a, lo a lot of decent people, you know, wanted to understand why this happened and uh, what's going on over there. So a lot of people actually went on a quest for knowledge and uh, enlightenment and, uh, and found out, uh, you know, uh, um, a lot of uh, nuances and important, uh, uh, you know... But isn't it... Do, I, I mean, don't you think that it's become more challenging for people when they see the representations of Islam, the boiled-down extreme ones of the Islamic State and so on that dominate the news coverage? Uh, people, it seems to me that people really struggle to, you know, to come to grips with that. They struggle, they struggle to have an honest conversation with Muslims. And, you know, which, who, who should they have that conversation with? Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, it's difficult. I mean, I mean, like, you know, growing up, I used to bemoan, you know, that Hollywood depiction of Muslims. But Islamic State is like, you know, the worst triple X rated violent Hollywood fantasy, you know, that's jumped out the screen into real, real life, life right. you know. Uh, 
and, and it's also, I think, confounded a lot of, not just non-Muslims, but a lot of Muslims, you know. Uh, and do you think they've done enough to, like, wrestle the narrative away from Islamic State to say what, you know, what the relationship is between Islam and politics or... It depends on, on who you're talking about. I mean, there are, there are Muslims uh, who are trying to, you know, re uh, mainstream Muslims are trying to reclaim their faith and, uh, and moderate, like in Pakistan, like you were talking yesterday about the big movement for reform and getting rid of Sharia and all that stuff. Um, the, 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 there are Muslims who have actually been, it's, who had questions about their religion and it's driven them away from their faith. I was talking to an Egyptian colleague uh, last night and today about her friends who used to be Islamists and are now atheists, you know, um, and there are Muslims who are in such denial or shock that they blaming it on, on the outside world that ISIS is not actually a real uh, Islamic uh, creation, that it was created by, I don't know, the CIA or Mossad or, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, you know to, to destroy Syria and to destroy the Arab world and discredit Islam and stuff like that. So... Um, Whereas, of course, the void in Iraq helped create the vacuum in which uh, uh, Islamic State could, uh, could grow, you can't, you can't say it's the West you know, uh, that, 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 that cr created ISIS. It may have helped lay the conditions mm. f for such an uh, uh, nihilistic ideology to emerge, but you know, uh, it would be ridiculous to, to blame them for the ideology. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's come out of Islamic soil, you know. It's a very extreme manifestation uh, of selective and literalist interpretations of certain passages of the Quran and certain medieval scholars and stuff like that. Do, 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 does Islam need a reformation? Uh, Islam's had lots of reformations. But some were successful, some were unsuccessful. Um, I think more than whether Islam needs an, a reformation ideologically, I think Muslim societies need reformation. If, if religion is privatized, I mean put in the private sphere, uh, and made an, a, 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 an issue of personal choice, and religion is taken out of politics in, in Muslim societies where it plays a role, then, you know, Islam can be whatever, you can adopt whatever brand of Islam you want, but you're not doing anyone any harm, you're doing your, only yourself uh, harm. But, but it's not just about religion or ideology. If Islam didn't exist tomorrow, the Arab and what we call the Muslim world's uh, countries that are in trouble today would not magically be like, uh, sal uh, you know, find salvation. There are structural problems globally that have kept underdeveloped countries underdeveloped, huh? and if those are not addressed, something else will come and replace it. You know, you know there are structural, uh, global structural problems, and there are local structural problems. The global structural problems are the inequalities of the distribution of resources, um, and the, the, the local structural problems are authoritarianism and brutality and all these uh, things. So even if there was no Islam tomorrow, the problems of Muslim societies would not end. All right, great. We're going to end it there. Thank you so much, Khaled. Uh, thanks for your time. Um, Khaled, thanks very much for bearing with us. Uh, Khaled's book is called Islam for the Politically Incorrect, and it's going to be published when? In September. Hopefully. In September. Thanks, thanks for your time. Have a nice day. Yeah. It's so different to going out with my curly hair. Just going to, buy, uh, uh, to the shop to buy something was horrible. They made me feel like an idiot. 
With the degree to which hijab and Muslim, the hijab and Muslim women have become interlinked in the Western imagination, some cannot get their heads around liberal Muslim women who dress differently. For example, Rola Jibril, the Palestinian-Italian journalist, remembers an incident when she first started working on Italian television and turned up in a figure-hugging white dress. I quote her here, The producer asked me if I was a Muslim because of the way I dressed. He couldn't understand that this was the way I had always dressed. He thought it was the influence of Italy on me. Nevertheless, being a secular, liberal Arab woman has not shielded Jibril from the rising tide of Islamophobia, with the hijab just the noose with which the far right wants to figuratively hang Muslims. This was on naked display when peroxide blonde Geert Wilders, with the eccentric hair, the Dutch precursor of Donald Trump, bizarrely proposed what he called a head rag tax. What, you may wonder, was the leader of the party for... Um, thanks very much for coming along. Uh, my name is Declan Walsh. I'm a journalist with the New York Times newspaper based in Cairo in Egypt. I'm the bureau chief over there. Um, I'm here with writer Khaled Dieb, and uh, hopefully you're, if you're at the right seminar, you know you're at uh, Addressing um, Islam for the Politically Incorrect, Addressing the Myths and Preconceptions Surrounding Islam. Um, very briefly, it just seems to me that it's never been a more important time to have this kind of conversation, uh, certainly in the Western world, but I think also in the Islamic world, um, when we look at the rise of populist nationalism in Europe and in the United States, uh, when we look at sort of violent attacks and the reactions that they have engendered um, across this continent and others, um, but also, I think, inside the debate that's taking place in different forms inside the Muslim world about what it means to be Muslim and about how that re relationship with the outside world plays out. Um, we're going to talk about uh, women. We're going to talk about the notion of jihad. We are going to talk about... What else do you want to talk about? Uh, whatever comes up. Whatever clash comes of, up. Clash of civilizations. Clash of civilizations. Uh, terrorism, everything. <laughs> we'll, we'll be guided by uh, a book that Khaled is in the process of writing. He's going to read first uh, from part, an excerpt from a chapter in that book about women in Islam. Um, we're going to talk briefly, and then we're going to throw it up into you. Um, I'm hoping this, this will be a session that will be very much driven by questions from the audience. Uh, queries that you might, might have or observations you'd like to make um, and we'll take the conversation from there. So, Khaled. Uh, thanks, Declan. Thank you for the introduction and you made uh, a lot of valid points which uh, we'll address during uh, the discussion. So, yes, the book I'm working on is called Islam for the Politically Incorrect. Um, and um, the reason... Uh, I decided to write it is because for years now, as a journalist and as a human being, I've noticed an increasingly polarized and alarmingly uh, dangerous debate, uh, often uninformed, often supported by half-truths and myths. Um, and, um, and this debate uh, is spinning out of control, whether it's between Muslim societies and Western societies, whether it's within each, you know, there's a lot of uh, misconception and um, misunderstanding. So I'm going to start off by reading, uh, as Declan said, as, um, an excerpt from the chapter on women. The reason I've chosen to, to read from this chapter is because women, whether they want it or not, have become a, a battle, an ideological battlefield, a battleground, uh, uh, both between the two sides and within each camp, and uh, it's um, and also between the patriarchy and, you know, the anti-patriarchy, if you like. So, um, and, I, and I'm going to look at one area which is symbolically uh, related to this debate. I'm going to start by reading the introduction to the section on, on the hijab. So just bear with me as I pull it up. Okay. 
Okay, so the section is entitled The Fabric of Piety. Rarely, if ever, has a piece of cloth created such controversy. For European and American conservatives, the hijab threatens to shed the fabric of society. For conservatives in Muslim countries, the Islamic headscarf stitches society together, and like the hymen, the honor of the family and the community hangs by the flimsy threads of the hijab. In Europe, the hijab is widely regarded as a symbol of oppression and barbarity, and the woman who wears one is often considered to be a downtrodden victim. Afrah Nasser, who normally leaves her curly hair exposed, decided as a social experiment to put on a headscarf in Sweden, where she lives, and gauge the reactions she received. I quote here, I wore a scarf in the Ethiopian style worn by my grandmother. I looked like I was wearing a hijab. The Ethiopian Yemeni writer and feminist explained, My experience 